Well, hello everyone. This is Alfadi, and I'm so excited uh, to uh, have uh, you with us to today. As I mentioned in my announcement, uh, today is a very special day. Uh, it's always special when we have someone who made a journey to Christ, and especially when they come from a Muslim background, of course. That's the intent of my show. I come from that background. But today is even more special because we have someone that, when I was a Muslim, uh, he probably would have considered me to be his enemy, and I would have considered him to be my enemy. But today we are united in Christ. And of course, I don't want to jump the gun. just want to welcome all of you here with us. Thank you for waiting on us, and thank you for the moderators for making time to... Uh, as always, to control and uh, manage, you know, the discussions. We remind everyone to please stay focused on the topic. Today is a testimony. Someone sharing their journey. Ask questions relative to that. Do not attack. Do not insult. We're not going to tolerate this. But do not distract as well. Please come with your genuine questions. With that says, it is with distinct honor that I am presenting to you a dear brother. I'm going to call him. Pastor Faridi, and I'll let him say the rest. He is born and raised in a devout Muslim family in Iran. And uh, of course, after years uh, you know, of being faithfully following the religion of Islam, somehow uh, you know, he ventured into this thought of jihad. I wonder how you know, he thought about that. But of course, we'll let him mention this, for, of course, yes. for you. But I am so thankful that the Lord who did the de the dying on his behalf already, open his eyes, and today he is a child of God. With that says, brother, I want to just welcome you on the show, and I cannot really find the proper way or words uh, to, to share my excitement. Thank you so much for making time for us. Thank you, brother, uh, for wonderful introduction. Um, I'm a pastor now, but I used to be a religious Muslim. I was born in the in country of Iran. Uh, correctly, it is actually Iran, the way we say it. But um, Arabic, Iran. Iran. that's right. <laughs> it's an honor to be here, to be with your audience. And anyone that watches from America, happy 4th of July, happy Independence Day. It's wonderful that we have freedom in this nation, that we can worship our God freely. Amen, brother. Amen. Why don't you walk us through your journey uh, from the start, you know, um, the family you lived in, you said it was devout. Explain what, what do you mean by devout. Also, be free to talk about, obviously, if you were a Shia Muslim, if you're a Sunni Muslim. I mean, I, I have a suspicion what, what that would look like, but I mm -hmm. want the audience to know, and maybe even uh, through the course of the discussion, we can even explain the differences. All that to say, just walk us through the early journey as a Muslim. Of course, Brother Al. Um, I was born in Iran, and... Uh, during the war, the country of Iran was fighting against Iraq. The Shias were uh, killing the Sunni of Iraq and the Sunnis of Iraq killing the Shias of Iran. And uh, that war was eight years. So when I was born, they called my generation, the generation that was bo uh, uh, born during the war time, the eight years, they called us the war generation. And um, I was in a Muslim family. We were from Shia. Most of the Iranians, 95%, 90 more than that, uh, they are Shia Muslims. They are from, from they, we believe that we are from the blood, bloodline of Ali, which is the uh, son-in-law of the Prophet of Muhammad. So we have, we shared the blood of the Prophet in, our, in us. So, um, and during that time, my uncle, two of my cousins actually joined voluntarily the jihad, the war against the Iraqis, the Sunnis, the evil people, and uh, gave, gave up their lives. We, as a family, we became the family of martyrs. We were, uh, we were elevated in the community that we lived in. The alley, the streets that we, oh, my, my grand, grandfather and grandmother lived on, they turned our, uh, that, uh, the name of that alley to our last name. That's how they honored us. And, and I remember we bragged about what kind of a Muslim we are because we fulfilled the ultimate goal of Islam. And that was the martyrdom becoming Shaheed, if you um, correctly want to put that word in. And um, my mom, my family, very devout. And um, we tried to be good Muslims and we bragged about it. We were proud of the stuff that we have done for Islam. And um, I remember when other relatives, other family members would come to our home 
and they would say, okay, we went to Mecca, we went where Haji is, we went to pilgrims, we did this, we did that to Islam. We would tell them, we have shed blood for Islam. That is nothing comparing to what you can do for Islam. So that was our um, status in the community we lived on. And then there was a lot of mosques and a lot of um, shrines and a lot of uh, Islamic ceremonies, uh, the Shia ways around our uh, neighborhood. And I was really involved. I loved Islam. I truly were, was marinated in the Islamic law, in, in Sharia, in reciting the Quran, memorizing the Quran, in learning everything about Islam because um, my mom, um, call, she provided a ground for us as Muslim that we can be mature and good Muslim just like my uncle that was a martyr. So that's the kind of environment I grew up in and that's the kind of Muslim I was. And I remember uh, in those early days, as a six, seven years old child, when I was praying to Allah one day early in the morning, I washed myself with cold water because they say it has sabab, it has good points for you. It, it has positive stuff if you wash yourself with cold, cold water with a ceremonial way and stand before Allah and pray in the morning. And I was doing that and I'm, I'm Iranian, I speak Farsi, but my mother tongue is Persian. And, but I had to memorize uh, chapters of the Quran and recite those in my prayer in Arabic. And I went to my mom and I said, Mom, uh, can I pray to God of Islam in my mother tongue? And my mom said, a good Muslim surrenders, submits, does not ask questions. And if you don't want to end up in hell, you just surrender yourself to the will of Allah. And I was afraid to go to hell. So I very much surrendered my will my brain, everything that was about me, I surrendered to Allah and I dedicated myself and I said, no more question, I'm just going to follow as a slave. So, to God so of were you playing brain in Arabic? Of course, yes. That is, that is fascinating. I have a lot of questions for you, my friend, but keep going. <laughs> yes, and then, so um, I didn't want to go to hell. So Islam is the religion that you have to perform. You, have po you get points. So I wanted that the right hand of the scale, which is the good deeds, to outweigh the bad deeds when, when I meet Allah in, the, in paradise after my death. And um, I was trying to earn all the good deeds. So I prayed five times a day, which is Shia, uh, Shia way is three times, but you do the five times in three times of the day. It's not separately. And um, I memorized a whole lot of the Quran. I went to the Quran classes and to mosque when I was six years old, seven years old. I mean, I pushed a lot of, uh, I put a lot of pressure on myself to memorize a whole lot of chapters of the Quran to, because the belief would, if a, if a man as a Muslim, you memorize the Quran, Allah cannot burn your body or your brain because it's the Quran inside it. So I was jamming in a lot of chapters of the Quran and, um, I had a I good like voice. I like the word jamming. <laughs> and um, I had a good voice. So I would, uh, before the uh, prayer, I would do the azan, the call, the call to the prayer, and uh, try to do good as much as I could as a Muslim and, and fulfill what is asked of me and um, perform as a good Muslim. But brother, I tell you, this, this, this was burdening me. And uh, I remember many times when I failed, when I lied, when I sinned against Allah, that burden, that guilt, that shame that I carried, I could not get rid of. And then uh, Shia way of um, cleansing yourself, Shia way of uh, uh, sanctifying yourself and getting rid of your sin is to be sorrowful for your sins, is to weep and wail and beat yourself physically, flagellate yourself physically in order to clean yourself and rid of that sin that you have committed. And um, for the death of the Imams that we had, the 12th Imam, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and all of that, we have a lot of ceremonies during, their, um, um, during this anniversary of their death day, we go to the shrines or mosques and we cry and wail and beat ourselves. I beat myself on my chest many times, on the side of my head, with chains to my back, and I imitated the death of the first Imam, Ali, right. 
he was standing before Allah praying one day, one day in mosque and a, actually a Persian man came from the back and hit his head with a poisonous sword and killed him. So I imitated his death by uh, hitting my head with a sharp sword to yeah. imitate his death. And the blood were running down my, the side of my head and running on my shoulder that I, shed, that, that I, might, that I may be earning points that I, by shedding my own blood, I can be sanctified before Allah. That Amen. I earn, that I earn the um, favor of this imams, that they intercede for my behalf when I see Allah, because they were sinless, because they were pure according to the Islamic Shia way of living. So these are the stuff I did. Do you, do you mind if I ask questions about this uh, before? Yeah. For, because uh, I know people are salivating. So, so this act that you mentioned, you know, basically, uh, uh, you know, flagging yourself or hitting yourself with with a, with a knife. I see some kids with a knife or with a sword. Obviously, you said it's a replication of the assassination of mm -hmm. Imam Ali. Is that mm -hmm. you know so? So in doing so, you're suffering as if you are suffering on his behalf. Is that Correct. a fair statement? Um, you're you're imitating his death you're trying to become like him because in his life and his in his death the way that he is than he was you're trying to become like him because he is sinless yes the the al insan al kamil the the perfect man is the prophet of islam you have to become like him, yes, in the ways of Islam, in the traditions of Islam. But on his way, as Shias, we become like our own leaders, our own imams. Hmm. They died in war, you die in war. They live like this, you, you live like that. So that's the point. Even in his death, we wanted to become like him. And then by imitating his death, by, by shedding our own blood, we're asking for his sanctification, for his forgiveness. Do you believe, or did you believe, uh, or let's say, do they believe today that he's alive? Um, in in paradise, yes, he is. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just asking, you know, as, mm -hmm. as um, you know, the devil's advocate here, just asking you questions. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some of the Muslims gonna take this clip and and they will claim that I am the devil, but that's okay. Uh, all that to say, so so when you're doing this, you mm -hmm. are. Um, you know, trying to join him one way or another. It's almost like showing obedience to him, uh, favor to him. So so is it fair, brother, to say that were you longing to be with Ali or were you longing to be with Muhammad or both if you die as a martyr? Of course, these are steps to get to Muhammad. Ali right. is the step. Aziz, is Ali it. is the caliph. Got so it. eventually becoming like Ali, meaning becoming one of the disciples, one of the um, students of the Islamic Shia because because according to Shia Ali was the right caliph after Muhammad right. and becoming like him is becoming uh, like Muhammad so and as I said Islam is the religion of performance you have to perform the the, the harder you work and the things that they have told you these are the ways of Islam the Sharia of Islam is this way. The harder you work for those, you're earning points. And you're trying to gain favor with him, with Ali, in order to gain favor with Allah. Because they believe that they're sinless. They're in intercessors. They are the medium between you and Allah. You're not worthy as a Muslim to approach Allah directly. Who, who, who you think you are. So you have to go to that man, that man, that man that has already gained the favor of Allah for dying for him, to in order to gain favor with Allah through him. Amen, amen. Uh, give me a second here. I want to thank everyone again. I want to thank uh, the moderators who are with us. Here is uh, we're going to call him Pastor Faridi. Uh, he is from Iran, as we say it, of course, or Iran, as uh, the West says it. He is sharing his testimony about. Him coming to Christ from a Shia Muslim background, and with that says, uh, 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 there is this person here by the name uh, Frauk uh, Koylog. Uh, I want to apologize to you. I myself was going to put someone else on timeout, and your name popped up by accident. So my apology. It's my bad. The other person that I put in timeout was asking exactly what I expected—a question that has nothing whatsoever to do with the topic. 
So with that says, if anyone is going to ask any questions that are not related to the topic, expect a timeout just to think about it. With that says, brother, uh, one more question before you continue. Mm -hmm. So is is the, uh, I mean, these shrines that you mentioned, you know, that to perform pilgrimage, um, I want you at some point today to shed some light on that. Are they mandatory to do in addition to Mecca? Are they voluntary to do? I mean, so on and so forth. And what is expected, you know, basically when you do something like this by way of deeds. And the second thing I want you to talk about when you can, of course, who determines which shrine is worthy to visit? So I'll, I'll be interested to hear about that. Um, so the whole idea of doing all of these deeds is to making the right hand of the scale heavier because you cannot stop from sinning and having evil thoughts and doing something bad. But since it is the scale that been, been, being held at the, at the judgment day, all of this prayer and fasting during Ramadan, those are the basics that you have to do. It's just, but the plus side for Shia Muslim is this mourning, is this weeping and wailing and, and self-flagellating because the way that a lamb is sacrificed in our Shia, because during the Muharram time, the, 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 the months of the blood, that's as we believe, the months that Hussein was killed, the third um, uh, imam, the most important imam in the Shia Muslim, the way that he died, he was sacrificed. So you sacrifice your life the way that he did. And that is sacrificing everything, your life, your your will, everything that belongs to you doesn't belong to you. It does belong to Allah. So by going to their ways, you're just uh, becoming like them and earning points that hopefully they have told us many times. I was talking to a Shia Muslim today that he reminded me this, that they told us if you, uh, uh, when, when you um, drop a tear for the Hussein, the third Imam, that tear will wipe away your sins if you can do that. And we have to force ourselves to cry and show how sorrowful we are for his death, for his loss, and so on and so forth. So wow. these are all performance-based religion. It's told and taught for thousands, hundreds of years, 1,400 years of Shia in Iran, that we became like Hussein and Ali and Hassan and all the Imams in order to earn that favor. So that's, this is not like bonus, but it is mandatory in our part of the religion. Because at the end of the day, brother, you know that we don't, as Muslims, Shia or Sunni, we don't have guaranteed salvation. There is nothing that can tell us one verse in the, the Quran or one of the saying of the prophet of, of the self-claimed prophet of Islam that okay if you do this or do that other than martyrdom the paradise is guaranteed so it's the now, same in the Shia theology also I mean I don't want to assume things but it's the same it sounds like it in the Shia theology just like it is in the Sunni theology mm -hmm. only martyrdom will get you to paradise uh, other than that you have to rely on your works. There is no guarantee, like you said. Mm -hmm. You know, we still have time, if you don't mind me asking. So how will you accumulate your works uh, in, uh, in the Shia, uh, you know, basically uh, part of theology since there is these prayers to the saints? Is that one of, part of your works if you pray absolutely. to them? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. The five, the five pillars are exactly the same. The Salat and the Hajj and so on and so forth, the pilgrimage and so on and so forth. They're all the same. The... Um, the fasting is the same. Um, the major things are the same. Just the way how to get it there may, it may dif differ. But we have teachings in, in Shia Muslim that I have heard myself from the mouth of the imams in the mosques. That if a Shia can kill six Sunni Muslims, will enter paradise, guaranteed. Wow. So, so is it true that the Ayatollah, for instance, or those who are higher level clerks, they truly believe that they have an inspiration directly from God when they come up with rulings? Is that is that a true statement? Ayatollah means the sign of Allah on earth. He is right. That's what I am. By Allah on earth. Who is that person? That's the Ayatollah Khamenei of Iran, the leader of the Islamic regime. What Whatever is his translation 
of the doctrine of Islam of the Quran. That's exactly what Allah wants to do. And if he calls for war, war will happen because the the uh, appointed leader of Allah on earth, he is here in behalf of the 12th Imam. Until mm -hmm. the return of the 12th Imam, he is that person. That's why he's called Imam, just right. as the 12th Imam. Because the 12th Imam is believed that he is in absence. Right. He's in a well hiding, in hiding, till he comes back. Until that time, the leader of Iran is the leader of the Shia Muslims. Whatever he says, it's whatever Allah says. Did you ever question in your mind, why am I praying to a shrine where somebody's dead? I had, of course, I had some thoughts, but I would rebuke those thoughts out of fear of going to hell. And I heard that you know in, in you know shia clerks in general especially from early islam they truly believe that the quran as the sunnis have it has been tampered with was that a truth uh, you know thought uh say one more time brother uh, there is this idea that the shia clerks especially mm -hmm. in the early islamic time they truly believe that uthman and the sunnis have tampered with the quran is that is that true yeah, yeah absolutely yes so how did you get around that? I mean, do they have another Quran that they trust? So, as you know, uh, I remember we had two two versions of the Quran translated in Farsi. There are two versions. It was the Quran al-Majid and the Quran al-Karim. But as I said, brother, we don't critically think in Islam. That ability is rebuked and it is absolutely forbidden i remember when i was on a train traveling to the northeast of iran to the shrine of the eighth imam imam Riza. we had i went to a scholar asked questions that i have many questions that they could not answer and i said what do I need to do? I'm on a pilgrimage, Shia Muslim pilgrimage. It's on the 8th Imam or you go to Karbala, the city in Iraq, before you get to Hajj, to Mecca. You go to those pilgrimage and um, the exact way of seven times going around the uh, the Kaaba, we do the seven times around the shrines of the Imam Reza or Hussein or Hassan or so on and so forth. Wow, wow. The, the, thing, the thing is that I went to a very high, highly scholar that I told him my struggles. I told him, and he told me, my son, you are not worthy enough. You have to do more. You have to sanctify yourself more. You have to dedicate yourself more. Regardless of how much I did, it was never enough. So that condemnation that I was always condemned that I'm not measuring up, that I'm not reaching, that I'm not worthy enough that i'm not sanctified it was always a feeling of guilt and shame that it was always with me so so pastor did you think or did were you taught that imam ali or imam hassan or hussein or imam riza or others they will step up in front of allah and intercede on your behalf or sure. is it allah gonna see your heart and see how devoted you are for them allah allah will never look at you he will look at what you have done for them and if they intercede or come in the middle and say, man, because of my sake, let this guy in. It's amazing, brother. I mean, it's almost like the gospel, uh, by the way. I mean, we're going to get there. Uh, one last question, I promise, about the, the Quran, and then I want you to continue. Um, you know, again, I did my study, but I don't want to also sound like I am fabricating things here. Is it true that the Shia Quran contains two additional chapters? Two to four, yes. Two to four. Okay, yes. this is the first I've heard about four. Yes. Okay. It, okay. It, it, it sometimes varies how they, they don't say that there's differences. They say it, the, the, the way that they chapter them or the, the way that they uh, put the numbers together, it added, but it's they say, they claim it's exact the same. Makes sense? In numbering, it's different, not in wording or it's, but it's what all one. But in numbering and in chaptering way of that, how they organize the book, it just may differ. 
what about Surah al Nurain and the one that talks about Imam Ali? Uh, is that there? Um, it depends what version you read. Yes. Okay. It, yes. Very some good. some version that has that, but um, these are deeply thinking and they're deeply getting involved in the religion and knowing that everyone that I think that I think I have talked to as Shias, when you get a little below the surface, they have no idea. What is happening? What's the? Oh, there is very vari variance, or there is differences. There is this. We don't ask questions, brother. As I said, you just surrender as a Muslim. You submit yourself. Absolutely. Keep going, brother. So, so you were, you know, doing what you're doing. You know, flogging yourself, bleeding yourself, and and then what? Absolutely. So, I'm 18 years old, finished high school, and um, military service is mandatory in Iran, and you have to join. And um, uh, when th they line you up, when um, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people that graduate from high school and then they have to serve the military for two years and you line up and then they name, for example, that line or that line or that line for specific parts of the military that you serve. Mine, because I was very active in the mosque, I was a religious person, they assigned mine to a religious military, which is the Islamic Revolutionary Army. I served there, I was trained there two years. And um, when I was uh, a soldier during that time, they handpick you for a movement called, l l listen to the irony of this, they handpick you for a movement called On the Path of Light. They, so, when I was born, there was a war was happening. They took us to the same exact area that the most of war was happening, which is in the western, southwestern side of Iran that borders with Iraq, and most of the war was happening in that area. They took us there. They showed us the area, and um, we, we, we came very close to the border. You could see the flag of Iraq on one side and flag of Iran in, in this side and the barbed wires and the landmine. And uh, they, they told us to, t to take our boots off and take our socks off because this is the holy ground. It's been watered by the blood of the martyrs. And when we walked, they said, this is the holy ground. And um, we, the same way that we, we did it in mosques and shrines, we went, when we went there, we start praying to those martyrs. We start to familiarizing ourselves with the culture of jihad and martyrdom. A part of the training was to unite your spirit with the spirit of martyrdom. Part of the training was that they put us in empty tombs and graves during the night to fight the fear of death. This is some part of the training. And they told you you have to be selfless. You have to give it up. Everything that belongs, you have to give it up to be a soldier for Allah. That when the opportunity arrives, you climb the ladder of martyrdom. You climb the ladder of jihad to the paradise of Islam. And then when you become a martyr, you can intercede for your family members, your relatives, your your friends for 70 of them. Yeah, and, and that's that's exactly what we were taught, of course, uh, in the Shia uh, theology as well. So certainly there is some overlap. Were you there, by the way, when when the Saudi government, uh, because of the tension that was taking place with the Iranian government, they they prevented Iranian pilgrims to go to Saudi? Were you aware? I mean, like, were you uh, old enough to remember that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I remember that when the Iranians were in Mecca, and uh, supposedly a bridge fell on them and killed many of them. And after that, the Iranians decided not to go. And then the tension rise between the uh, Sunni leaders and the Shia leaders of Iran. And uh, the Iranians, the Shia, encouraged the pilgrimage to the eighth Imam and the, and the third and the second that is in uh, uh, Iraq. Go to Najaf, the city in Iraq, that is the, uh, the tomb of the Ali, and to the third Imam and his brother Abu Faz, go to those and do the pilgrimage there, and it's as valuable as it could. you go to Mecca. Fascinating. Fasc I've always wondered about that when that happened myself, and I, uh, you know, now you gave me the answer. Um, so, uh, what did you do after that, brother? 
Well, uh, after I finished my military service, I came home. I had a dream, man. I get to the honor to become a martyr, give my life. And um, that's, uh, I prayed to Allah many more times. I became really religious. I mean, I was religious, but after my military service, after uh, uh, being a part of the movement, I really was, I mean, I, I was dedicated. I was, I was said, I'm done. And I watched many Islamic programs on the TV, which is very rare of a Muslim man to do it because, you know, um, um, Islam teaches you hypocrisy to the second power. So you're when you're outside in the mosque before other Muslims, you're a good Muslim. But when you come home, you're a pervert. You watch all the satellites, junk, and all the pornography, and and so many other things. But when you drink and you do a lot of things within your home, but when you're outside, you're a good Muslim. But I wasn't like that. I was inside out a good Muslim. And when I came home, I watched a lot of um, sermons. A Muslim imam uh, preached and I was reciting the Quran. And every evening, Muslims usually, they ha you have to force them to show up in a mosque once a week. But I would go every evening to the uh, group or party, pr uh, the um, group prayer at the, at, at the evening salat in the mosque. And uh, I... Um, serve the Muslims that they came to the mosque. I um, kind of organized their shoes. And um, after the, um, the uh, Salat, when the, when the sermon comes out, I gave them tea and served them however I could. Just, I was dedicated. I wanted to become, I want to become a person, a Muslim that pleases Allah. And uh, one year of doing that, and uh, it was after my military service, I was um, waiting that hopefully um, a war happens between Iran and Israel or Iran and America, that I can join the war because at that time, uh, Iran was in a stable place. And um, that didn't happen. And I lost purpose in life. And I really became hopeless about my future. I called the Iranian government cowards because they were they weren't starting a war, even though there's thousands of Muslims, young men like me in Iran that are waiting for that opportunity. The Islamic regime is not a starting, so I called them cowards, and I lost purpose and hope in life, and uh, the purpose that Islam gives you it wasn't coming to um, fulfillment in my life, and I kind of was. Um, disillusioned a little bit but depression when i when i when, when, when i lost hope depression settled in and i remember as a young man i would lock in, lock myself inside my room and i hated myself so much that i would pluck out my hair and try to hurt myself i contemplated on suicide many times i get a knife and cut myself to get rid of myself because but i because i knew the doctrine of islam I was afraid to commit suicide because I thought if I kill myself, hell is guaranteed. It's a doctrine of Islam. If you commit suicide, hell is guaranteed. I lived in hell in this life. But the dilemma was if I kill myself, I will end up in hell for eternity. And out of, depra out of uh, desperation, one day I called a friend of mine. Uh, we, we grow up together and... Uh, his mom and my dad, they both worked in the hospital, and we know one another uh, from very young age. And um, when when I we went to high school, we went to middle school together, and um, we finished high school. When I was going to military service, because this guy had flat feet, he was medically exempt. So for two, three years, I didn't know what is he doing with his life. So I called him one day, and um, when he showed up that day, I saw a light coming out of his face and his he was shining. He was very calm. You could feel the peace. Everything about this guy, this old friend of mine, it bothered me so really bad that day that I said, man, there's, there's something very strange, very weird about this guy. And I pushed him and I asked him many times, what is going on? What is going on? What, what, what kind of drug are you on? What's the formula? And I bothered him many times. 
and uh, he gave up and he said he became a Christian. And I said, what? You became Christian? You know, as a good Muslim, you believe in fatalism. You believe that everything Allah has predestined, preordained for you. There is no breaking out of the will of Allah for your life. It's your fate to be a Muslim. You're born here, you'll die. You, you're born a Muslim, you die a Muslim. You right. became a Christian. <laughs> that didn't really, I couldn't understand. What, what, what does that mean that I became what, a Christian? What, what was your understanding of Christianity growing up in a Shia, uh, basic, as a Shia Muslim? What was your understanding of Christianity? Christianity is um, a religion of the Westerners and is the, uh, as the religion that you're born in, like other religions. And um, we call it Masihi, the people that follow the prophet of uh, uh, the prophet Isa, and uh, they're in error. Even though if they keep doing good, and um, eventually Masi will come back and turn them all to Muslims, and 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 they, they become Muslim at the end. But that's how much I knew. It's it's something. It was just totally, and. Uh, Brother, I have heard many times, many, many times, they say, Muslims say, oh, we love Jesus or we, we respect him. I remember other than Muhammad, we didn't respect nobody. Even in a school, middle school, we had songs that how minor other prophets are to Muhammad. I appreciate your honesty. I mean, that's exactly what we try to say. I mean, I, it's one thing to sell, tell me I love Jesus is another to uh, to to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus. Uh, words are cheap. You know, anyone can love anybody, but that doesn't mean anything, of course. And Jesus said, if you love me, you follow me and you, you, you do my what I tell you. You Amen. can tell me all day I love somebody. But when you go and betray him and don't you don't do what they ask you to do, your love is no love. I mean, that's what Jesus says in John 14. If you love me, you will do my commandments. Notice the condition and the reward. And I will ask the father and he will send you another comforter. You that's see, right. that's the reward. So what, where is that comforter? To dwell in you, the Holy Spirit, meaning you are sealed by the spirit, meaning you are a follower of Jesus, a believer. So anyway, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, brother. Keep going. So, so when he told you that he became a Christian and you were shocked, what happened? And I was totally, I could not. I mean, fathom, I could not digest what he said. And I argued with him really. I mean, I mean, you could see the vein on my, uh, on my neck. I mean, I'm thinking about killing him. I, I'm thinking about choking this guy. Regardless of what, what I threw at him, he calmly, very calmly, with the peace he carried, that bothered me. He just talked about how good Jesus is. And what he has done for him and his family and the changes and the hope that he has come brought to his life. But I, brother, I have ears. Look, I have ears, but I couldn't hear. There was something that like, it was held my ears. I couldn't hear what is this guy saying. I was just thinking about how can I attack him? How can I do this? How can I do that? How can I argue him? What a sin he is in and what a um, shameful thing he has done. But this guy didn't lose any 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 peace. He just calmly told me about the goodness of God, who Jesus is, and he called him Father. And and I'm like, this guy is going crazy. Two hours we argued, and that one sentence that changed changed my life for eternity. He said, "You are asking me why I carry a peace. You're asking for the formula." That has changed my life. I'm telling you it is Jesus. But this is the last thing I want to tell you. This is his sentence. He said Jesus was humiliated. He was bruised. He was beaten. His precious blood was shed on the cross. He gave his life that you may have eternal life. Hallelujah. That is the one most beautiful thing I have ever encountered in my life one every lie that islam has told me every lie that they said i have to accomplish in order to be sanctified to have eternal life to enter paradise that wasn't working it made my life more miserable 
He said, it is finished in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you believe in that and what he has done for you, you will have eternal life. Out of desperation, I fell on my knees and I begged him, what do I need to do? The word of God pierced my heart and I fell on my knees. I felt so naked, so weak. I had nothing to offer God. I said, what do I need to do? And he said, I want you to close your eyes, repent of your sins, and tell him that you are the only Savior and you are the only Lord of my life, Jesus Christ. I did that when I opened my eyes. For the first time in 23 years, I felt peace. Amen, my brother. Amen. Let me ask you, that that's so exciting. I mean, I want to, of course, elaborate now about what happened, but let me ask a quick question. Uh, since, since the days of Daniel, you know, when, when the uh, Jews were basically taken into exile over there, was there any knowledge growing up that, you know, the Jews were here, they were in exile, you know, Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, uh, King Cyrus and everybody, you know, had any encounters with the chosen people, anything related to that at all? The only thing I remember from the Jews is when I was going to school in middle school as a teenager, I had to walk around the, uh, the Jewish neighborhood for two extra miles or three extra miles to not get uncleaned, to put my feet where the Jews walk. I had to avoid their neighborhood, walk extra miles to avoiding getting unclean wow. where, they, where they where they go. That's all I knew about Jews because they are so evil in the eyes of the Iranian Shias. So evil, so filthy that anything that goes wrong in our community, anything that goes wrong in our country, it's done by the evil Jews. And that was my mentality. Hmm. But that changed when I encountered the love of the king of the Jews. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fascinating, fascinating. So you notice peace, and then what? What happened? My goodness, the hatred, the hopelessness that was inside me, it was cured. It was bombed with the oil of the Holy Spirit. And man, I enjoyed that moment. I wanted to give it to every member of my family, everyone that I knew. I wanted to go around and tell them that what a wonderful encounter I had. And I walked, after I dropped off my friend, I, I went home and I was thinking, what an exciting and ex amazing experience. But all of a sudden, this dawned on me. Man, I committed shirk. I was so I have associated someone else with Allah, and that that is an one unforgivable sin. And if anybody knows that, they will prosecute and execute me for it if I confess right, it. Right, right. So I tried as a good Muslim, I knew everything about what would happen to an apostate. We call him murtad. What happened to an apostate? If another Muslim catches an apostate and kill him, they would he would get rewarded. There would be no judge or court or anything. If a couple people confess that was a apostate, a mortad, somebody that left Islam, and someone killed him, they would get rewarded for it. I knew all of that, and when I when I went home that time, that dawned on me, and I said, "No, I'm I might." I just will enjoy this moment. I will not tell anybody. I keep it silent. But I couldn't. And I couldn't. For a couple of weeks, I tried so hard. But very soon, my family realized I'm not going to mosque anymore. Not, not every evening I'm showing up at mosque. And my mom like was, what is happening to our son? And he's not watching any more religious uh, TV shows or any of that. And they were wondering what's going on. Maybe, maybe they said maybe uh, it's a, a change in his life or, or, or maybe he's thinking about something else or he's getting too old, whatever. But um, I remember one day I was praying to Jesus 
I turned the lights off. I was in my room praying to Jesus. I mean, I had a wonderful fellowship with him. I was talking to him in Farsi. He understood my language. My goodness, what a fresh air was that, that I can talk to God in my mother tongue. And I could actually understand what I was saying. I didn't need translation. I could just go to him boldly, approach his yeah. throne, and, yeah. and tell him what's what's my struggles, what I want. And I was just in fellowship with him. I just was enjoying the moment. And then my dad walked in the room, and he said, "Excuse me, what is going on here?" He's heard me because I was speaking loudly in Farsi, and they're already suspicious. He said, uh, "What is going on here?" And uh, I said, Dad, I'm praying. And then, you know, the Islamic prayer, you go through the ritual. Everybody knows you're praying because right. you're on, in right. your prayer rock, you're facing Me Mecca, you have your uh, prayer stone or prayer uh, uh, mod or whatever that uh, you wanted that thing that's called because uh, sometimes it's made out of Mecca's uh, soil, that dirt, or sometimes it's a piece of rock from uh, one of the shrines. So none of that is happening. What kind of prayer is this? So he was shocked. What kind of prayer is this? I said, I'm praying. And then he he was he's an he was an educated person. He was a very smart person. He said, Who are you praying to? Because the way I was praying was very different than the regular way of prayer. And I said, Dad, I'm praying to Jesus. And uh, I wish he would have stopped there. Wow. But he kept asking questions, and he said, why Jesus? Because I said, Dad, Jesus is alive. You know he's alive, and, and, and he can hear my voice, and I'm just talking to him, and I'm praying to him. And then um, I wish that conversation would have stopped, or I was, I was a little wiser. And then he said, why not Muhammad? And I said, Dad, Muhammad is dead. He cannot hear. And when I said that, he said, Astaghfirullah. And it's like, as soon as I said that, you could see flame coming off of his shoulder. And he charged. He was a very strong man. I mean, I, I was lifted from the, um, he, he, he got a hold of my shirt. I was lifted from the uh, ground. He quoted me. And as he is cursing, he is like punching and kicking. And man, I'm protecting myself. And pulled away and run away from home. That's what happened. And uh, What did you think when, when that reaction came about? Did you feel like it was justified from your father's uh, perspective? Or did you really question even Islam more now and, and see for yourself what Islam teaches? You know, um, all of the tolerance and all of the love of Islam, all of the relationship of a son and father, they all went out of the way when I announced that I'm praying in Jesus. Even, did, even though I didn't confess that I'm a Christian, That's I just right. been praying to Jesus. All of it. And when I said Muhammad is dead, all of that love, all of that relationship, everything that I thought it is a priority, it went out of the, it went out of the window. And the only thing mattered to them that I am submitting but to Islam and that day and that moment, it, it, it didn't look like that for him. So uh, what did you do next when you ran away? Well, I tried um, a few nights. I slept on the rooftops and uh, on doorsteps of some people and uh, it, it was bec becoming really miserable. I was getting, I was getting uh, beaten by uh, cockroaches and it was horrible. And it was a summer day, and uh, it was warm. Tehran is a, uh, the, the capital city of Iran. It's very warm, very dry during summer, and I was just getting miserable. And I uh, called my friend that talked to me about Jesus and uh, caused this con conversion. Excuse me. When I called him, I said, D uh, "Dude, you have put me in this trouble, and my dad has found out." about me praying to Jesus, and I, I really can't go back to home. And um, he said, he this piece that he carried, I mean, it's supernatural. He said, look, brother, my parents were like that in the beginning, but now they're all believers. Just come to our home. 
we pray about it and this this is going to get solved so i went to their home and when i went to their home the whole family four of them father mo father mother brother and sister four of them they were all converts from islam shia islam to christianity hallelujah so the whole family held an underground church in their home church and that was my introduction to the underground church of iran and during that four months that i was out of the house in their homes i met other believers from other cities that they came because at that time when i was converting converted to christianity i thought i'm the second muslim in the history of islam that has converted from islam to christianity the first one is my friend the second one is me but when i when i when i was in their home i saw man i'm not alone there's a whole lot of people the you're number six <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the second one. I'm actually, there's hundreds of them. And um, during that time, I really realized that um, um, this is a this is this is a great movement is happening. It's just it's just happening underground in hidden, but it's going very strong. Did it, did, did it give you courage and joy, or did you become even more concerned now that, that there is more, and you're concerned about their safety, for instance? Well, absolutely it gave me a lot of joy because i thought i'm alone and i have to solve this issue by myself and nobody can understand me because i'm like alone in this but i had brothers and sisters that they were threatened beaten severely thrown in jail they were in solid solidarity in excuse me in uh, um uh, the cells that they put, I think it's called, conf my goodness, the, 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 word, ha the word has um, slipped my uh, mind. And uh, for your audience, English is my third language, actually. So um, um, when, when solidarity confinement. Oh, sol uh, solidarity confinement. Got it. Got it. Many yeah, of them were in those. In those thrown in jail by themselves. Them. Absolutely. Yeah. Many of them were, were in those jail, jail cells. So they knew what persecution is. They knew to lay their la life down for Jesus and going all in. So that gave me a lot of courage, a lot of I was really edified by them that I'm not in this alone. And this is actually they taught me a lot of scriptures, a lot of verses in the Bible that talks about it, that when we are persecuted for Jesus, it's actually an honor to take that persecution for him. It's not because of us. It's for his sake, and he will reward us for it. So it was a phenomenal time, that four months that I was out of our home. And uh, uh, we spent hours in prayers, in fellowship, in fasting. But but that was, we, ha we had a real relationship with the living God, with our holy and righteous and just and loving Father. Mm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So are you still are you still in Iran so far? Uh, yeah. So, yes. so what happened? What happened after that? So um, after after about four months, uh, since my mom couldn't believe what I told my dad, even though my dad said that's what I told uh, to, told him, my mom couldn't believe, you know, I'm, I'm, I was the most religious, zealot, zealous Muslim in our home. I was I was the way that honored my mom in Islam and she took a lot of pride in the way that I followed Islam and the friends I had and the sh shrines I went to the pilgrimage I went to the uh, serving in the mosque and the way I beat myself and uh, self-flagellate myself all of that honored my my, my uh, mom but she couldn't believe that I could say stuff like that she couldn't you know fathom the, the whole idea of uh, Muhammad is dead and praying to Jesus so she talked my dad into bringing me home and giving me an opportunity to hear for herself. So during that four months of being out of the house and being marinated in the word of God with other uh, like-minded believers, man, I was, I knew a whole lot. I just, I just found it. And uh, during that time, I actually had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and uh, two times within myself, I heard inside. 
it is it is a voice that is more clear than that my voice that you can hear but it is inside i heard your home when i was at church two times i heard your home man i found truth the truth found me Praise i was Lord. so encouraged i was so blessed i was so at peace with god i had no guilt and shame i was reading the bible I went through the four Gospels five times each in one week. This book was just talking to me. I was re I was getting um, the living word of God. It was talking to me. I mean, I was just, I fell in love with Jesus. I fell in love with the Holy Spirit and the teachings of the New Testament and what, what the Lord had for me. It was being revealed to me. But when I went home, in the beginning, they wanted to test me and, and see if I just made a mistake. If I was just like maybe in an error, they could correct me. They were nice in the beginning. And then I tried to convert me. I tried to convert them. They tried to convert me or revert me back to Islam. And I said, no, 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 guys. Jesus loves you. Jesus has died for your sins. You have to believe he's the Lord. He's the son of the living God. And they're like, what in the world has happened to our son? Mm -hmm. And then they got really upset and they mocked me. Every sort of manipulation, tactics, demonic strategies that they could use to lure me back to Islam wasn't working. So they gave up hope. And they kind of cut ties with their son. I wasn't... I wasn't kicked out, but I was financially, emotionally, and physically manipulated. The beating didn't work. The emotional harassing didn't work. And eventually, because at that time I was in our, my, my, my dad's home and he, is, he was a sole provider, the financial, the economic ben benefits were shut down. It was cut. So I had to go work for the first time in age 23. And I said, no, no matter what. I mean, I'm I'm in love well, with you. I mean, we, we we have we have of course Westerners listening to you. Uh, working at 23 is is definitely okay with them, but uh, you need to let them know. In our culture, we stay with our parents mostly yeah. all the time. Absolutely. Even I mean, my brother's married now. As a kid, staying with my parents, it's totally normal. But in in the West, we think, oh, he's 18 years old, they have to go off their ways, and we're they call it what empty nesters or something like we don't have we it doesn't mean anything to our culture it doesn't mean anything to our that's culture anyway that's right so i was at home but i wasn't in a relationship with my family anymore because every time we talked about something i mean it was just um the um you could call it the world war i mean the 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 world views would go to war and um uh, the, the relationship wasn't there anymore. It was it was very strange moment. It was just very strange times. But I started working as a taxi driver and tried to provide for myself. And uh, uh, even I thought, man, the Bible says, if you're a thief, leave that, go work and give. I said, I'm not a thief, but I can go work and give. So that's what I did. I go spend uh, I go spend um, ten to twelve hours driving in the city of Tehran. And a taxi, and uh, I got. Um, I would earn something and would bring it to the church, and uh, try to spend, uh, just take care of my um, little needs, and then the rest of it just spend for the gospel. And then I, I had a New Testament, which is an illegal book in Iran. If you carry a New Testament, if it's not the Gospel of Barnabas, the only gospel that the Islamic regime of Iran approves. If it's not that gospel, it's illegal. My my New Testament, uh, it was on the dashboard of my taxi, and the passengers would come in and, and look at it. And they're like, what in the world? What's that book? What's it about? And I would give it a lot of opportunity to share with them about Jesus. Even though it's very dangerous, even though it's very difficult, but when you, when you know you find the truth, you have to give it to others. What is more sweet? What is, more, what is sweeter? Than Jesus and his love and his peace that you cannot that you hold from others so I put the uh, 
uh, New Testament on dashboard, talked to a lot of passengers. A lot of them loved it. A lot of them converted, gave their heart to the Lord. But we had a lot of opposition, a lot of hate. So many, so many people rolled their eyes. So many people cursed me. So many people that eventually they reported me. And they, when they reported to the government, and if the government gets their hand on you, man, you're done. I, I know believers, men, I'm talking about male believers, that they were raped in the Islamic regime's um, sale, uh, cells, the jail. They were, they were raped by other soldiers, by other uh, objects, to, that they humiliate them to the point that they give up Jesus. But they're standing. So I lived, I tried to live as a uh, believer, as a Christian in Iran. And I thought, man, I'm not bothering anybody. I'm not a threat to anybody, but I'm just sharing the gospel. But that is a biggest threat to the Islamic regime. It was in 2008 that Ahmadinejad went to the Senate of Iran or to the court of Iran and because the uh, because the church, the underground church, was growing so rapidly that it became a national threat. Ahmadinejad, the president of time, went to the uh, parliament or the court of Iran and said, "The Christians are stealing the soldiers of Islam out of the camp out of the camp of Islam, and they're exiting out of the camp to go to the." Uh, camp of Christianity, and we have to abolish, we have to exterminate them out of Iran. And that was the, the wave of persecution that came to the church, to the underground church. Many of the believers I know personally, they were arrested. And when they attack a network of churches, when they get one person, they beat them and torture them so much that they will eventually give up names. And uh, I tried to escape or flee from the city of Tehran, the capital, to go to another city. Maybe I could survive there. The only people I knew, they were Christians that I could trust. When I contacted them, when I told them, they wouldn't answer the family member or a neighbor answered the phone or their um, uh, their home. And they would say, oh, they were, they're missing or they're arrested or they were detained. And uh, some of the parents of the believers, they told me, please do not come around us. We already have enough trouble. And the circles of the believers, I knew it was getting tighter and tighter. It was just a matter of time. I stay and go to jail or I escape Iran. And that's what I did. I left Iran. How did you manage to leave um, without getting into details? I mean, was it easy to find a way out or was it too risky to, uh, to be able to do that? One of, one of the strategies of the Islamic regime is because the jails are being filled by Christians. They don't want them in there because when they throw them in jail, they go and start a jail ministry and convert other, uh, other people in jail. So they put them in um, solid, uh, solitary confinement. And uh, so at, at, during that time, they put pressure on them to escape and to get exiled somewhat voluntarily if it makes any sense they wanted them to leave because if they stay it's trouble still for the government and it's almost um, like they look the other way they correct. Look just just to just to get out and uh, during that time it was uh, in the beginning of 2009 that when i left and uh, i found myself in turkey looking for a smuggler to go to greece and from greece to the western europe but god had another plan for my life Amen. And uh, what happened after that, brother? So um, I became, I, I, I sought asylum. And after three years of interrogation, eventually they accepted my case. And America was generous enough. God bless this country. God bless America for all the freedom we have in this nation, which is uh, sometimes uh, when I talk to Americans, it really breaks my heart because they don't value it. From where I come from, I know what, what is it. What does it look like? What does it feel like? Feel like when I know, you're brother. I mean, I want to. I want to speak to those who yap their mouth and talk about, you know, uh, they don't like the freedom they have in here. Go and live in Iran. Go and live in the Middle East, and come and report back to us after one month. Yeah. In fact, I challenge you for one week. Stand up in the street and open your mouth and see what happens to you. Then come back and report to us. Do you appreciate it or not? 
Absolutely. I believe in my, um, um, one of the thing, brother, as a ministry, as a, as a pastor, I do, I go uh, to, it's called an English mission trip, but it's actually the work of the church to take the gospel to the other, other most of the uh, world. And um, I take with me Americans to the Middle East. I cannot tell where we go and what we do, but uh, I go to the Middle East and during two weeks, I make them to live with another persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. And they see what is the cost of being a Christian. What is the cost of living your life for Christ and what you have go through and what kind of a lifestyle you will have. And when they come back, many of them I have seen, after they come out of the plane, they raise their hand and thank God for America and all the freedom we have. Amen, my brother. So when you arrived to the U.S., um, uh, was part of that giving you a work permit also? Of course, yes. Uh, I, um, you have a one-year work permit, and then I can uh, apply for a uh, uh, permanent resident. And uh, I start working like uh, it's America. You have to work. So I did. Praise God. I'm a healthy man. And I was glad to work. And I can go to church and not be afraid and uh, of my life. And there's so many churches in every corner. And I was so happy here. And um, I started working. But, brother, after three years, I fell in the trap of American dream, as we know it. I call it American nightmare. Because we all, we without, all do. <laughs> yes, because without uh, subconsciously, without you actually knowing it, knowing it, you will start to fall in this trap to keep up with the Joneses. And you have to climb the ladder of success in this nation. We have to have this degrees or that degrees or do this and that. And I was so distracted from the purpose and the calling of God in my life. For three years, I was running after the world and all it could offer me, the nice homes and the nice um, cars and the nice this and the nice that and the education and the certifications. But uh, one day, uh, a minister, his name is Andrew Womack, I was watching his program on TV. He said, he reminded me that God has a purpose and a calling for my life, specifically. And if you don't fulfill that, you live your life wasting it. And I was convicted out of that one 20 minutes teaching. I said, Lord, I repented. I repent and I said, Lord, what is your calling? I got serious about my faith again after being um, silently and very, uh, very, um, how do you slip, the way that is very unknown to you. It's very slick, very, very um, strange to get just distracted from your calling and purpose in, in, in the kingdom, in the kingdom of God. So after that, I repent. And I dedicated, I said, Lord, I, I want to know that. I wonder what's your, what's your heart for me. I want to I know. I don't care for anything else in life. No success will matter to me. No um, car matter to me. No house matter to me. Not that God wants you to live on the street. I'm not saying that. But he wants you to fulfill the race that he has put you in. He wants you to run in that race, not in another person's race. Not in another shoes, uh, someone's, some, some other uh, people's shoe or someone, uh, someone else's um, work or, or job or some other things. So I, I, I saw him and he spoke to me clearly out of the book of Mark chapter 5. He told me the way that he told the legion possessed man. If anybody that is listening, that you, ha you have your Bibles, please go to... Uh, it's, it's my life story. In the book of Mark, it's repeated in the Luke chapter 8. There's a legion-possessed man, a man that has a legions of demons. Right. No one can, the Bible says no one would, no, no one would tame him. No one would put in shackles or chains. This guy would rip him, rip him out. And the Bible says his dwelling, his place of living was the cemetery, was the graveyard. That's where I slept to fight the fear of death in Islam. He said, when, when, when Jesus meets this man, sets him free, heals him, and the man wants to follow Jesus, and Jesus tells the man, go and 
tell your friends, your family, go tell them what marvelous things I have done for you. I mean, the, 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 word, of, the word of God became alive in my life. And, and it was like Jesus was talking to me personally. He said, I have done something marvelous, amazing for you. And I want you to go and tell people about it. And that was the end of my uh, secular career in America after three, four years of being here. I quit my job. And I said, I am, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go do what you tell me to do. You're my Lord. You have rescued me out of the kingdom of darkness. And I'm going to do what you ask me to do. And I'm going to fulfill what you have for me. That's wonderful, my brother. And then uh, from there, uh, did you um, get into ministry right away? Well, um, uh, it, it was unknown water. It was it was an um, it was a place that I didn't know uh, every step after that. But I took a step of faith. I quit my job and um, contacted uh, varieties of churches or ministries. Anybody that would let me in, that I share what what the Lord has done for me, preach the gospel to them, tell them how good God is, and uh, I would go and do it. But um, God ordained my step. After one step, I uh, finished Bible college um, actually last year. I went to full-time ministry three years ago. But uh, two years of it, uh, I was in Bible college and um, divine connection one after another. God ordained my steps and put a uh, light on it. And uh, I, as, as, as the Western term, it's called I'm in full-time ministry, but I'm just... A man that said, Lord, I'm going to do what you have for me. And I'm going to, I have no reservation. Whatever whatever you send me, whatever you ask me to do, I will do that. And that's how um, I came to the world of the ministry and just um, trying to find his will and fulfill it. So what is your ministry, brother? We get to irankristians.org. That's your website. Mm -hmm. What is it that, uh, you know, Pastor Faridi does in his ministry? And uh, you mentioned you take people to places. Again, I appreciate the, the need for safety and privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, wh whatever you can share, what do you do? And how can people follow you? How can also people support you? So... In our, in, a, in our ministry, yes, we go on a mission trip. You go to the Middle East, and uh, we have thousands of New Testaments in in that country that we go to, whatever language is that. And with, in our team, we go and hand out New Testaments to people and talk to Jesus, Jesus about the New Testament, about what Jesus has done, the, the good news of the gospel, that if they believe in Jesus, they will have eternal life. So we take and evangelize Muslims. That's one part. The second part is when people convert from Islam to Christianity, we make disciples of them. I pastor a church where I live in America. They are all former Muslims. They all came out of Islam. They came out of Islam. They need, they need to know the meat of the word of God. They need to learn to become a disciple. They need to know that the first purpose and priority in life is Jesus and not their occupation, not their homes, not their kids. It's Jesus. It's Lord. As the Bible says, if your father and mother become more important than God, if your brothers and sisters, you're not worthy of him. That is a verse in the Bible. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 10. So we, we make disciples that we prioritize Jesus, learn his uh, word, listen to it, and obey it. And um, so the two parts is to evangelize and find people that are uh, seeking after the Lord. They have hearts. They have dreams about Jesus. There are many of them. Um, in mo uh, Monday, I talked to him. Uh, so last year, we went on a mission trip to the Middle East. I talked to a um, – we talked to – our team talked to a lady – and um, she was not interested. She was a natural activist in Iran. And uh, she was in exile also. And uh, for seven months, they tried to convert her 
to Christianity, but she she's an agnostic. She doesn't have anything to do with religion. She hated the Islamic regime because they they um, kicked her out of the country because of uh, her activism. Our team showed up one day. We found uh, we we met her on the streets. We talked to her about Jesus. She said, "I don't know what is going on. Everybody sees me wants to what wanted me to convert to Christianity." Anyway, that night when she goes home, she has a dream. And next day she founded us on the street again. And now she's asking, what, what is this deal that when I talked to God, to you guys, I had a dream. So she wanted an interpretation for her dream. We sat down on a table in a dining room in, um, uh, in the Middle East. And we talked about, I interpreted her dream. And as soon as I told her the meaning of the dream and who was the person in the dream, she gave her heart to the Lord and became a Christian. And Monday, when I talked to her, she said, I was talking to my family in Iran. My sister-in-law, her mom, and her daughter all converted and gave their heart to the Lord. And uh, now they're looking for a place to be discipled. It's easy from Iranians, from Persians, Iranians, and Afghans. It's very easy to get converts because this, they're disillusioned with Islam. They hate everything about the Islamic regime. They don't want to do anything with the religion of the Arab man. They're ready to convert. God has cooked them. They're ripe. They're like the, the, the fruit that is ripe off the, uh, off the tree. You just touch them, they fall down. But making disciples, it's another uh, work of our ministry. So we connect them to the right online or underground church that they can go to and become disciples of Christ. So those are the um, two major things that, that the ministry does. And um, I translate a lot of material to Farsi. Or mother tongue because uh, it's a fairly Wonderful. young church and we need really good material and in, in, in uh, uh, that we can get from English and translate it to Farsi the book that um, it's called um, uh, not not a car let me let me get the name right um, but Josh McDell uh, it is um, Oh, more than a carpenter. More than a carpenter. Not <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. book has been translated by our ministry. Wonderful. And, um, people are reading it, and they realize that he's not only a prophet or a carpenter; he's actually the son of the living God that can change their lives for eternity. Hallelujah! Uh, again, uh, the website, if I'm correct, is IranChristians.org, and people can support you through that ministry, uh, that website, also. Yes, sir. Um, Iran Christians. It's because it's not one 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 Christian. It's Christians. Many are converting. Praise God. Yeah. So IranChristians.org is our website. Uh, the phone number, the email, and there is a donate tab. And if you want to um, help us awesome. in what we do, and and I believe I believe uh, our moderators put the link already. But I just wanted people to hear from you. Okay. Um, Tell us, uh, before we close, brother, the state of Christianity in Iran today. Is it true that, uh, you know, there is a spike that the largest, basically, uh, population of Christian converts in the Middle East is found in Iran? Is that a true statement? Without a doubt in my heart, absolute 100%. I believe with all of my heart, if the regime doesn't change under their nose, under the opp Islamic oppression, we will have an ex-Muslim majority in Iran very soon. Converts to Christianity very soon. It is, brother, every time I talk to a ministry and minister that they're in contact with Iranians, every day there's salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's amazing, brother. It is uh, the true revival. I mean, the, 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 the house of Islam is on fire. The house of Islam, the pillars, the five pillars of Islam are shaking. People are glory to God. People have dreams every single day I talk to them that they have an encounter with Jesus himself. And Jesus is sending them to another believer to another Christian, to another convert, to tell him the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is amazing what the Lord is doing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Uh, well, I mean, brother, I want to stay uh, with you for as long as we can, but I know, of course, I want to respect for your time. And I know some some of our uh, viewers are already past midnight in England, for instance, and in Europe, but they are really making time to stay here. One of them says, uh, uh, bonsoir. So, yeah, bonsoir to you. Uh, they're obviously uh, going to bed, but I'm thankful that uh, they, uh, they stuck around. Uh, all that to say, brother, hopefully you can join me again. I would love next time maybe to uh, talk about, uh, you know, the struggles of the new converts, uh, you know, um, the, the, the way that we need to really look for their spiritual needs and how we can feed them uh, spiritually more so than anything else. Obviously, there is material need, no doubt about it. But what I'm saying is sometimes we ignore the spiritual side and we focus only on celebrating and leaving them uh, to, uh, you know, hang and dry alone under persecution and so on and so forth. So I think Absolutely. we really need to spend time doing uh, things like this. And I want to thank, of course, those who gave through Super Chat. We still have a few minutes left. You know, sometimes it's really an excellent way to highlight your questions that way as well. I've been looking to see if there's any other questions. One question that just passed by earlier, um, not that I am advocating anyone to change their name, but but do you get any pushbacks when people find out that you're a Christian, but your name is Muhammad, basically? Yeah. It's, it has two benefits, you know. Uh, I get almost daily or weekly abuse with, from Muslims that you are a traitor. You have to put your name James or George or John or whatever else. You're a traitor. So my name has become a, th a thorn in their eyes, to be honest. And, um, but in, in the West, it, it gives me an opportunity to preach the gospel. For example, I was at uh, Chick-fil-A one day, I was in line with my car and that, uh, the, the young man came to my uh, window and after they took the order, what's the order on? What's the name on the order? I said, my name is Muhammad. And then the guy stepped back and I said, I'm a Christian Muhammad. And he was like, that's an oxymoron. I said, yeah, I know uh, because I was born and raised Muslim, but became a Christian. And I have, an, I have a story as the Lord has commanded me to tell people about it. So I get a chance even in a Chick-fil-A line to tell people what the Lord has done for me. And if they let him, because he's a gentleman, Jesus is a gentleman. If, it, if they let him, he will change their lives too. Hallelujah, my brother. Hallelujah. So that's, that, that's the purpose of the name. <laughs> uh, that's awesome, brother. Any last, uh, you know, words you want to share with not just our uh, viewers, but but the, to, to those who are going to watch this testimony? Undoubtedly, there'll be masses watching it. That's my prayer, brother. Uh, we have a large number of views. You know, I can tell everybody's excited about this, which means that more and more will be watching it, especially those who are Muslim or still Muslim, maybe those who are seeking and maybe those who are from your own homeland. Any yeah. words you want to share with them, brother? Let me speak to the Muslims first. I want to tell you with the, from the bottom of my heart, genuinely, I want to tell you uh, if you are still Muslim or you were born a Muslim, that is not your fate. God, God has a different plan for your life. He can change your destiny forever. The Bible says, that he's knocking on the door of your heart. He's a standing, waiting for you to open the door. He's not going to force the door open. But if you, when he knocks on the door of your heart, you already feeling the nudge. The spirit of God is revealing to me. Somebody is watching right at this moment that you have felt that God is putting this impression on your heart. But you have to, the Bible says you, ha you have to open that door. And let him in. And if you do that, you will taste what a sweet, what a wonderful, what an amazing God he is. He's not going to force it in you. I promise you the most important decision you will ever make in your life. If you to open your heart and ask him to forgive your sin. And if he is for real, if he is the truth, is if he is the way, prove that to you. And you ask him and you will see. When you feel, you sense, you experience the relationship you will have with the living God. You cannot purchase it. You cannot earn it. It is a gift. 
It is not done by works, the Bible says. It is a gift. It is free, but you have to receive it. You have to open that gift. Ask Jesus. He will change for even he, he will change your life once forever and you will once taste the goodness and mercy and kindness of God through Jesus Christ. So this is what I have for my Muslim friends that are watching. Lord. For my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is time to get serious. The time is short. It's not it's not time to play. It's time to get serious about your faith. It's about time to seek the Lord and find his purpose and calling for your life and run the race just like the Apostle Paul said, like a soldier. Lord, I'm, I'm surrendering to you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, you are the priority in my life. I want to know what you have for me. And when you run that race, you just taste life in that moment. Separated from his will for your life, it's like a fish out of the water. You struggle. But when you are in the water of what Jesus has for you, you are just in the environment that He has called you to be in, and you will feel and you will uh, uh, you will be fulfilled once for good. Thank you, my brother. Uh, again, uh, really, uh, we can spend hours talking. Uh, I can see that I have a uh, wonderful brother and Lord that we can minister together, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, see if we can work out uh, something with you. To come back again more than once, brother. I know you're busy, and I don't want to take you away from your ministry, but uh, uh, this is also a ministry and a field and uh, a good ground for you to reach uh, your, uh, you know, intended audience as well. So, thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us. Um, you know, as always, we are so blessed to have all of you watch. Uh, encourage you to share, of course, this. Uh, share it with as many people as you can, especially those who are from. Muslim background, and hopefully, you know, people from Persia as well. I mean, hopefully they will be blessed by mm -hmm. this. I, I I speak from my experience. I mean, those who come from I, uh, Iran are very, very open-minded, and it's, I've always had pleasant experience with them. Uh, I, I find them to be very respectful, at least to me, They're very open to, to di have a dialogue with me. So uh, take advantage of that uh, by all means. And the food, don't forget, Persian food is, is amazing. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Talk to yeah. me about it. I just got hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the same time thank you for those who gave through the super chat uh, tomorrow I'm going to have Sister Hatun same time 6pm we'll be talking about some of the uh, variants in the Quran and on uh, Friday on Sunday I'm going to have a special guest as always I like to tease you guys a special guest and it's going to be about prophecy so uh, we'll talk about that as well uh, tomorrow and I'll share more information brother once again thank you so much for your time pleasure I am so blessed to have you. Thank you, everyone. This is Al-Fadi over and out. God bless.